Hi everyone, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds cooperation, non-domination, mutual aid in your everyday life. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson. Got a fun conversation with Aris Politopoulos about video games, history, archaeology, education, anarchism. But first, um, a, a note on programming and scheduling. This was supposed to be an episode on Bakunin, that's the schedule. I'm hoping to have that out on the 1st of May. And then uh, Anarchism 101 is going to take a break, hopefully just for the month of May, although I still hope to have a weekly episode coming out. But my uh, ability to plan for the future has been compromised. Um, I have been ill. My wife has been ill. Our dog has been ill. And our cat is, uh, is terminally ill. And that has thrown everything off. Now, I've got enough recorded and edited that I think I can keep a weekly schedule, but I cannot have the schedule that I thought I was going to have before uh, all these setbacks came. So I will let you know when Anarchism 101 is back on track. Hopefully the Bakunin episode May 1st, and then hopefully another Anarchism 101 on June 1st. But we will see after the music video games. Hello, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson. I'm recording in a different spot, so there probably will be bird song. Actually, there's bird song right now. I hope you, listener, enjoy that. I hope, Aris, you enjoy that as well. My guest today is Aris Politopoulos. Did I say that moderately yeah, right? Yeah, very good. Um, and uh, I've actually already recorded an episode with Aris and some of his colleagues in the Black Travel Collective on the Graber Wingrove book, The Dawn of Everything, when, when you hear this episode, that one will not have aired yet because it is long and there's a lot of editing to do. But uh, I got in touch with Aris because of his interest in anarchism and archaeology. And once I got to know him a little bit, I found out that he works on archaeology and video games. And as someone with a, a longstanding interest in video games, this just sounded fascinating. So I brought Aris back on the show for the first time, his second first appearance, to, exactly. to talk a little bit about video games and archaeology and, and education as it relates to video games and history and all of this fascinating stuff. So, Aris, thank, thanks for coming on the show. No, thank you for having me again for the first time. Uh, I absolutely <laughs> love the time traveling that's happening here. Yeah, it's this this digital world is so is so confusing and things go things go out exactly. of order, right? So exactly. we've we're already there into it. So why don't why don't you just start by telling us how you how you got into to video games as a as a yeah. not not how you not how you got into video games. If you want to do that, if you want to do that also. My my parents got me an NES a Nintendo system with Super Mario when I was like six. That's how I got into video games. Yeah. But, but how did you get into them academically or personally? I mean, it's a combination in a way because, as you said, like I'm also just a big time gamer, right? My parents didn't didn't get it for me. They got it for themselves back then. But they had bought um, a Sega Mega Drive when I was also like five or six. And then you know, I was also there. So what can you do? <laughs> um, the, but the it, Mega Drive that is a yeah. Uh, wow. Sorry. Go go ahead. Absolutely. We could you and I could just talk video games. It sounds like um, absolutely. But let's let's not do that for the listeners' sake. No, but so I since then I've been a gamer. Right? I've been playing video games basically all my life. Points of my life spending unreasonable amounts of time in front of the PC, just cracking hours in World of Warcraft or whatever. So at some point during my PhD, I had this sort of idea that, I mean, I can be elaborate about it in, in once, but it wasn't really in once. It really was, I spent so much time playing video games. And I also spent so much time in my office doing my PhD because it was the first or second year of my PhD. So what if... I combine the two, and then I can do more of both. Uh, instead of having one cutting down time from the other. It was a very personal sort of selfish thing in the beginning. Um, and then it turned out that it actually works. It actually combines. 
I had Googled up a bit, see if anybody else had done it. Back then it was a handful of people that were concerned with it. People like Andrew Reinhardt and Tara Copplestone and and um, Sean Graham, uh, just to name some of the most prominent names. But it was done like in the blog sphere, right? So it was either like MA students, PhD students who were like me, gamers, and they just wanted to do their passion. So I thought, hey, this is absolutely fantastic. Got in contact, started to talk with some people about it. And then I thought, all right, there is some merit into it, as in some merit being I'm having fun with it, which is the primary drive behind a lot of the stuff that we do that I'm going to talk about later. So we had this thing in Leiden here where I work, which was called the Archaeological Forum. And there, basically, it was an open forum where you could say, I have something to present. I need an hour to present it. It was once a month or something. So I found the guy who was organizing it, Angus, told him, hey, I have this crazy idea about video games. And he said, okay, I'm also a gamer, so go ahead and present it. (laughs) And I presented it, and it, it was received very well. And then we got two more PhDs. Angus was a postdoc, but then we got Sheila and Krein. We got together and we said, hey, this is a really fun idea. Let's do something together with it. Uh, and that was in 2015. And since then, we've been doing tons of stuff, really, with, with it. And there are tons of stuff that we can do that we can talk about. I guess uh, as a like point of professional interest, I want to ask if there was resistance to the study of video games. I certainly, I've done a lot of work with science Mm. fiction. I I taught classes on Star Trek and there's always people who are like, is this really a a topic worthy of a class? Now, Mm. as as you and I both know, of course these are worthy topics. And then if it's in the 19th century, you're allowed to study anything. But there's this sense that something fun, like a TV show or video games, the thing that you are doing for fun, there's a sense, I get a sense from older scholars maybe that you're like, trying to get away with something if you were a serious yeah. scholar you would be you would be reading books or looking at grecian exactly. urns but you, you're kind of a joke if you're doing star trek or uh god of war is that did, yeah. that did that come up at all in your journey yeah very much so it still comes up i mean in a way actually it's interesting that you bring that up because i'm I, I'm currently working in a paper specifically about that topic, about about fun. So we can talk about it when when it comes out, uh, hopefully somewhere later this year. But I'm very, in a weird way, as also as a scholar, but as a person as well, I'm very interested in fun, and I think fun is contrary to popular belief. Fun should be and is, even if we don't acknowledge it, uh, an academic endeavor in a way. We're straying away from the topic a bit, but <laughs> um, but we had a lot of resistance, especially in the beginning. So the first lectures that we gave, or that I gave, or that we gave as a group, I'm saying as a group, it's the Fali Foundation. I can I'll talk about it in a bit. Um, yeah, people were thought it was quirky. Some people thought it was kind of cool. Um, so in a way, people were letting us do it. So we had conference presentations. Um, in the CAA or whatever, or the EAA. And it had this weird feeling of we, we are creating a tiny corner, not only us, but other people, Megan Dennis and a bunch of other people who are doing this. But it's done as a quirky thing, right? It's not going to be the thing that's going to bring you the big grants. It's not going to be the thing that's going to be, a, you can't teach a full class on games. You can't do like a full-blown research on games. Um, we had also a lot of... Fl- laughs in not in a bad sense but people thinking yeah that sounds fun that's i'm not a gamer it it, it looks fun whatever and we even uh, uh, kind of optimistically had applied for a really big erc grant back then in like the european research council grant which got rejected but a lot of the feedback we got was around the fact that it's not it's not super serious so to we try to fix this which we didn't, but we tried to fix this by doing a a survey here at the at the faculty, and we basically surveyed students and staff members, and said, "All right, we're doing this thing with video games and archaeology. What do you think? Are you a gamer? Do you think there is merit in this connection? Do you think people learn from video games and stuff?" And it turns out that people, 
when answering the, the survey, they were very much more positive about it. They were like, yeah, I do see merit. And yes, it was something like 60% of the staff members were gamers. <laughs> right? So people hate to admit it in the professional settings, in setting, but in when it's anonymous, then it wasn't the problem. So we had to fight this indeed, and we still have to fight it a lot. Um, but yeah, it's clear It's clear that there, there is merit in it, whether people will fight it or not. Yeah, so talking about straying from the topic, I, now I just kind of want to talk about fun. I don't know if you know, but uh, Gra Graber has an article uh, about yeah. fun Yeah, in the Baffler, like, yeah. and he uses Kropotkin. So I'll connect it. We haven't connected it to anarchism yet. So I'll connect it to anarchism, which is one of the things and education one of the things for me mm -hmm. that i've had the most difficulty with in my in my teaching career yeah is the idea that education mm -hmm. isn't supposed to be fun and if yeah. the sense that the students are are having fun mm -hmm. you are doing something wrong i guess under yeah. the assumption that they're not learning yeah if you study dewey or william james or any of these people they say the only learning is engaged learning and I think Kropotkin and Graeber are like are right. Nothing engages you like fun. So yeah. this, this idea that somehow fun should be avoided in the educational context, it's not only wrong, I would say it's the it's the precise opposite. You can force people to learn, I guess, with with threats and uh, and grades and everything. But but why? If you've got fun right there, why would you yeah. why would you do threats? Um, yeah instead uh and then the other thing that 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 came to mind when you were talking about this is in in american culture at least there's always this sense of the of the dominant art form the great form that is maybe not the most popular but has the deepest resonance and availability for study and so it starts off poetry and then in the in the 20th century you know, everyone's studying poetry, early 20th century. We now look back on that time in America as the great heyday of the great American novel. But, you know, when when uh, Hemingway and Faulkner and Fitzgerald were writing, people weren't writing dissertations on them. They were writing dissertations on, on poetry. And then uh, the great heyday of the study of those people was the second half of the 20th century. But that's that's supposed to be the age of cinema. You yeah. know, the 50s and 60s and 70s, it's the movies is where the, you know, American culture is dominant. And for maybe like seven years with The Wire and Mad Men, it was it was TV, like literally 10 years. And I would not be surprised if in the not too distant future, someone is describing video games in the same way that that the novels of Fitzgerald mm -hmm. and Faulkner are described as the, yeah. as the thing that if you study them, you will truly understand what 2022 was like. Do you think that's coming? I think in a way, so also from, I think it comes out from the thing that you're saying as well, that research is sort of has started compressing things because we understand now that we can, that in fact, all different kinds of media can be studied as forms of expressions of the societies that produce them, right? It's It sounds a little bit like, too obvious, but yeah, often, yeah, it's, often, yeah, it's oftentimes we forget. It's a controversial yeah. claim that everything can be studied as an expression of society. How dare you yeah. study video games? It is controversial. Yeah, it, it can be controversial, but in a way, we currently we do study cinema, and there are big film studies and stuff, and you you can make make profound claims based on movies and and um, directors and whatnot. Um, and so the time has started compressing in research as to the things that we can study. And if you're studying into if you're studying game studies, maybe that it's not that much yet, but already in game studies, games as an art form is something that is considered very seriously and is being studied. And if you look into researchers like Mata Haggis, for example, He's talking about different forms of games where we do have video games purely as an art form where fun, in this case, may, may not be a serious consideration, but it's purely for the art, the artistic expression. Um, so in a way, it is kind of happening, 
and I think it's going to happen much more. If you look into the classics of what whatever would be considered as a classic, right? If you nowadays, if you talk about Bioshock, for example, you're not going to talk about Bi- yeah, you can play the remastered version and yada yada, and it's actually really nice because I've been playing it. But you can I've talk been, about. I have to say, I've been playing Bioshock remastered version as well. Sorry, yeah, go it's... ahead. <laughs> so, but you can, if you talk about Bioshock, the reason that it's in the, that you want to replay it is because it is a classic. It is. It has something that has to do with the history of games, even for more recent games. You want to play Dark Souls not because it's. I mean, for me, it is the best Dark Souls, but because it has. It's a historic moment in the development of games. It started an entire genre. It marks a shift in how we tell stories within games. Um, if you talk about older games, like if you want to talk about Ocarina of Time, right? If you want to talk about the first Prince of Persia, you can do media studies on them. You can do, it's called media archaeology, which is more of a media studies field than, than an archaeology. But in a way, you can even do like, you can study them as artifacts. And there are people who are doing it. John Aycock is, is a person like that, who's a computer scientist. And he tries to excavate code, right? He reverse engineers very old games from the 80s and tries to understand the thought process behind the development of these games by reverse engineering them. So all of this stuff are kind of happening in a way. And what I think is interesting is that it's exactly because this stuff are happening that we can showcase that there is a one connection between games and the past, right? So we can study the past of games and you know it, it has started becoming a, a true past already from the late like 50s, 60s. Mm-hmm. And a lot of video games talk about the past. A lot of video games talk about history, have historical backgrounds or backdrops, uh, have historical influences, and even the connection between, and that I always think is a very interesting thing, The one of the oldest, not the oldest, but one, a really old, well-known game is called Hammurabi, or the Sumer game. It's from the 60s. You can find it online, the, the basic version from the seven, 1974, if I remember correctly. So already from the 60s, we have a video game that is also historical because it deals with the city of Lagos and you playing as Hammurabi and whatnot. So both in any way that you tackle it, there is a connection between video games and the past. And I think that is on its own very interesting and part of the reason that it makes it a worthwhile archaeological endeavor. That, uh, that That's all so interesting, Lars. I mean, I'm sort of overwhelmed with the amount of ground that we've that we've already covered. I guess um, the next step for for me, and you can tell me if there's another way you want to go instead of this is, you know, I was telling you recently that there was an article in the Atlantic where uh, the question of like, what are we going to do now that kids are learning their history from video games instead of, I guess they thought people were learning their history from uh, academic classes or history textbooks, but obviously people are learning history from, from Hollywood movies from from novels, like from just misheard things. History is passed to us as this living thing yeah. in a way that is not the way that history is meant to be transmitted according to the official transmitters of history, which is to say history professors and, and history teachers, which I have been a high school history teacher. Um, yeah. But now, you know, people, I, I guess, now know Greek and, and Norse mythology from... Uh, are those the assassin games that are that are doing that? I'm blanking on. You know, there's yes. there's all games, of yeah. this all of this history yeah. now. History is uh, alive. All these intense mm. battle simulations for European wars and presumably other wars. People are getting their history from video games now. So what does that what yeah. what does that mean? It's interesting that you're bringing it in this way because we have a lot of. <laughs> similar ideas so one of the things that i myself with my colleagues from the value foundation have been talking for a very long time is exactly this challenge that there are a lot of people nowadays who have who really want to play with the past 
right? There are a lot of people who have very effective experiences with the past through games. They really, they like it. They think it's fun, but they also think it's informative. They think it's interesting. It's something that people clearly want to do. And it's very easy to, to make this argument just by looking at the gross sellings of historical video games, right? And the amount of hours being spent. The comparison I always like to make is that if you look at the, um, the civilization games, the civilization, Sid Meier civilization, if you look at Civ... Um, so there was a, in 2016, I think, or at some point 2017, the developers of Civilization V made a claim that between 20... 10 and 2016, according to their data, the collective humanity had spent 1.2 billion hours playing Civilization V. 1.2 billion hours. So I thought... I think how... I accounted for half of those hours. Yeah, I, I, might as well have been me the other half. Uh, but I, I, I thought, okay, what does it mean, 1.2 billion hours? Because it's a factor, and excuse me for my, for my <laughs> friends, but it's a fact on of ours. There's no other way to put it. So if you quantify the amount of hours people have spent in the six largest heritage museums of the world, the Louvre and the National Museum of China and the Met and the Vatican Museum and the British Museum, um, they have spent, the collective humanity has spent the same amount of time visiting these museums and playing Civilization V. So only one game <laughs> like offers just such a giant experience of the past. And yet, as you pointed out, the problem is, or the challenge is, that a lot of these games are being made without any communication well with those who produce that, that knowledge. The historians, the archaeologists, the archivists, the anthropologists, and f clearly, they don't necessarily need them to sell, right? Because these games are commercial games. They have a primary motive, which is to make money. So clearly, they don't need it. Um, but that creates the problem that you're describing, that then these experiences with the past are limited, can be problematic. Uh, they have all sorts of issues of, of westernized views on the past and so on. But what I would say is that in this problem, we also have an opportunity. And, and that opportunity is that we need to understand that these products can be studied and these products should be studied by us, the, the heritage experts, but it should be studied not as something to pedantically point out its flaws, uh, but something that affects people, something that takes into account the, the human agents, something that takes into account the cultural context in which these games are made and the cultural context they refer to. And in the end, it can sort of, it, it can create this locus, right? It can, this digital sort of playgrounds, which are the video games, they can create this locus where we can talk about the past into a much wider audience, an audience that is receptive and interested in it. So instead of us just bashing it down, we should see it as an opportunity to talk more about it. And once we do that, then the game developers will also take notice. And then the game developers will also be interested in talking to us. I love I love this vision, Aris. I mean, certainly in, in one sense, there's this sense that, yeah, it, it makes sense in a university classroom to play civilization with students and then talk about like, okay, what does it mean that like Egypt and the United States start at the same time and then Gandhi comes in with tanks and defeats both of them? Like that yeah. That seems to me to be an interesting conversation you can have. Yeah, but that's exactly the thing. It's an interesting conversation to have because it, it makes you think about yes. things. So like one thing that I was doing a lot in, in one of my classes was I wanted to, I was picking up topics and to talk about them, instead of starting off with the archaeological theory about them, I was starting off with a game about them. So I talked, wanted to talk about the late Bronze Age collapse. I would start with discussing fallout. What does it mean to have a society that has collapsed? What do we see? What do people think? I wanted to talk about, um, I don't know, yeah, civilization. What, 
what is, does the term civilization mean? All right, let's look at the game that is called civilization. Uh, and it brings all these interesting points to, to discuss with. And um, one of the things, so as I've said, I'm a member of this research group. We're called the Value Foundation. You can put down a bunch of links if you want. And we've been working on, on, on this intersection between video games and the past now for, excuse me, for several years. Um, and these are some of the stuff that we do a lot. Right, so we're interested in, well, in knowledge and how video games can help with knowledge, but we're also interested in in the in the uh, democratic prospects of games. The fact that it's a medium that's more accessible, it's a medium that's more open, or it can be. It has the potential to be more open. It has the potential to be more diverse as well, and in the end, it creates a more accessible avenue. I'm not saying it's the ultimate accessibility medium because there are a lot of issues there as well but it does offer an opportunity and so we try to bridge that gap that we were talking about between game developers and and us and the archaeologists and the historians right we do conferences we do the interactive past conference that where we it's a biannual thing that we get developers and scholars to talk about video games and archaeology, we write blog posts, we do public events, and we can talk a bit later about the public events because I think this is also an interesting topic to talk about. Um, but we also do streaming. So for years now, we've been having this, this Twitch channel where we just literally sit and play games and talk about them and talk about their connection with the past. And we bring in guests or we bring in friends and talk about let's say historical agency and assassin's creed and we even we were lucky enough to, to get a, a small grant for it uh, uh, about a year ago so we developed it into a bigger project it's called the streaming streaming the past and we hired uh, three student assistants that have weekly series so there is a historian there is an archaeologist there is a student of political sciences and they all have their own series and they play games and talk about the past. And then that happens three days a week. And then I stream one day a week or one of my colleagues from values stream one day a week. And so, I mean, even whenever the stream is, go the this podcast is going to air, there will likely be a stream talking about video games in the past. And, and this is a way to do it. This is a way of showing that yeah, we are engaged with, we talk about this and there is value in talking about this and there's so many things you can talk about. I've been streaming now for, for five odd years and there are still so many games that, that we haven't covered. And streaming is a full-time job if you want to do it properly and I have a job so it, I can't also stream. Um, but I use this in my classroom as well. I often tell them, hey, instead of, Instead of having a weekly assignment, come watch my stream. And then next time we talk about it in the classroom and tell me what you thought, right? Yeah, and it seems like you could assign them to stream as well or give that Absolutely, as an yeah. option. There's there's so many options. I mean, you're really blowing my mind here, Ars. I can say I I haven't had much of an opportunity to to have games in the classroom. So when I taught my first science fiction class at the University of North Carolina, the students were like, how, how did you not include Bioshock? Bioshock yeah. needs to be in here. And I said, I don't, I don't even know how I would, uh, how I would assign Bioshock. I had no institutional support for that. And then I was teaching some classes at a different institution where the, the, the class was grant funded. And the person who gave me the grant was like, and I would love to see video games in this as well. And so of course I went to the technology people and I was like, we've got money. Can we get video games in the students' hands? And they said, we don't, we don't know how to do that. <laughs> like, we don't, we don't know how to, like, if you say, yeah. hey, I need this book, they're like, it'll be there tomorrow. But if you say, I need Bioshock, that's, people, yeah. people don't know how to do that. But I'm hearing that you've developed some ways, you know, to, to make this happen. I mean, we, we, so with my colleague Angus, who is a, an assistant professor at the Digital Humanities, and, and Sibyl, who is a professor, Sibyl Lamas is a professor of new media. We've developed 
So we thought, okay, maybe in the standard curriculum, some things can be a little bit more difficult. But here in Leiden, we have, um, it's called the Honors College. And the Honors College is for like students who want to take extra courses and whatnot. And as part of our project, the Past at Play Lab, we decided to develop a class. We call it the very uh, similarly, the Past at Play class. And we, 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 um, we said, hey, what is the budget for this course? Because we need material. And what did we do? We said the, the class revolves around obviously past and play and games. So we bought with the available funding and it does require some funding, at least in the, as in the beginning, we bought, we got 18 Steam accounts and we put games in them. And now it's 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 a return, it's a return investment because we don't have to buy these games anymore. We just have them there now. Every year we can use the, the funding for other stuff, but the course is structured around these seven games that are in the Steam account. So every week we have a topic. We talk about post-colonialism. We talk about uh, intersectionality and queer archaeology. We talk about all sorts of like uh, fun uh, based on, on Graeber's paper, as, as you said earlier, we have all these topics and then associated with it is a video game. And the task is for students just to play one game a week and write, write a vignette about it, write an experiential sort of journal entry about their experience playing that game and how they think it fits with the topic of the week. And it's very reflective. And then we sit in the classroom the first hour we talk about their experiences and whatnot. And the second hour, we just play the game. A student comes up, plays the game. Everybody else sits back, just watches them. And we have a conversation like a stream, but then for a class um, about that spe specific thing. So there are many, it, it creates just so many opportunities when you try to use video games. And it is true that it can be at least initially a bit de demanding on the, um, not every student has a computer that can play games, right? And and you need to create uh, accessibility avenues. You need to ask your university to at least allow some PCs for students to play these games. There are some logistics around it. Uh, but the opportunities are so many that I think it's worth trying to work with such logistics. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's absolutely right. And I'm, I'm, the other thing is now that you and other people are doing this, that serves as that serves as models. For example, I wouldn't have occurred to me to create Steam accounts that could be kind of legacy Steam accounts, but that makes sense. Yeah, my my problems were the hurdles over the accessibility and did students have the right computer and and everything. Um, I guess ugh, there's so many things to talk about, Aris. The the next thing that popped into my mind, based when you're talking about post-colonialism, and I've sort of mentioned this a little bit with civilization. There's still a, so there's still a big critique that essentially all role playing games go back to Dungeons and Dragons and the idea that the goal is to is to kill things. I mean certainly not all role playing games, but the default thing is how are you going to kill what you are going to uh, in, encounter? I cert, I read an interview with the guy who created Gears of War and he said guns are just so easy to build games around he's like I, I i want to design games around things besides guns but just the way technology works it's so easy yep. to have a gun that shoots and of course the entire genre of whether you're talking about the like heroic explorer um in assassin's creed or god of war or whatever or devil may cry who's fighting his way through dungeons or even even worse the the yeah. civilization series where it's like look you you are god you have all information perfectly accessible and your only mission is to destroy the entire world, or I guess you can do diplomacy, but that's just a, a different form fun. of, yeah, it's a different form of hegemony. And it's also not the, yeah. the game clearly doesn't want you to play it that way. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's more out there than I'm realizing, or is there something to say about the fact that mainstream video games at least do seem to be based around c conquest and, yeah. and murder? I think there are two two paths to, to this to this discussion. Uh, one is talking about the big games, um, the civilizations and the Assassin's Creed and whatnot. And it is true that these games, I mean, it 
so far it might sound like I'm sort of overvalorizing games. Um, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm not arguing that games are are perfect. Way far from it, in fact. Um, and as you say, a lot of these, especially the big games, tend to have this relatively violent approach to the past. So, Assassin's Creed, for example, which is praised very often for its authenticity and how beautiful things look, and they look stunning. If you play Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I went. I went to Delphi in Greece and took pictures of some of the ruins at Delphi and then juxtaposed them with the same places in the game and they look the same. I, I've published this. We, we published this yeah. with Angus and Chile and some other people. It, they look, it's stunning. I'll right? jump in here and say as, as an Americanist, the one that's set in, in the colonial, that's the set during the Revolutionary War, it is yeah. also, it is superbly done. Like yeah. as, as an Americanist, I was very impressed with how yeah. well they had created this environment. Yeah. Right. So that, that, and that's my, like, I would go as far as to say the currently best 3D environment of classical Athens comes from Assassin's Creed Odyssey. That's my hot take right here. But um, the only way in Assassin's Creed to interact with history is through violence, is through killing people. And you never kill the big names. You're not going to kill the historical figures that have names. You're only going to kill the nameless, the NPCs, right? Um, and and nowadays they've included the Discovery Tour, which is this literally a tour around the graphics of the game. But it is not a game. It's a tour. So what Assassin's Creed does is makes you be this sort of violent tourist in the past. That you go about just killing people and enjoying the scenery. Um, which is not very nice. And the same goes for, as you said, civilization. There are the way that the game sees itself is very teleological. It's very linear. There is only one path to progress. It's, it's, and this progress is extremely euphemistic. It always goes positively for the for the civilization that's winning. There's only good things to be had from the future, in a way, from the past future, I guess. Um, which is a very it's an, it's an extremely Western view of history. And of course, these developers don't want to, to have their games seen as political games. They don't want to see their games being politicized, and they don't like that, and they they will be vocal about it. But the fact of the matter is that they are very political. They have a lot of problems. When we talk about civilization and colonialism, it has tons of problems, and even though the newer installments have fixed some of these issues, it's still highly problematic because its core perspective is problematic. Now, at the same time, People love the game and still it sells 20, 30 million copies and still people play hundreds, if not thousands of hours on an indi in per individual playing Civilization VI. So again, the, the problem is there, but it depends on how you see that problem. And on the other hand, if we take away all these big games for a moment and we start looking at the smaller studios, the indie developers, those who are less concerned about making the big bucks, because whether we like it or not, Ubisoft and Firaxis and EA want the big bucks. The smaller studios who want who have more passion, they are also more interested in making something that is either more authentic or prettier or something that's closer, more diverse, more inclusive. And so we have some amazing examples. One of them is Never Alone. I, I don't know if you've seen Never Alone. I haven't Maybe. played it, but I've, I've heard of it. It, it, is, um, it is a beautiful game by, made by the... Um, I don't want to misquote this, so I'm going to have to look it up a, a quick moment. So it was made by the Cook Inlet Tribal Council, which is the council, the tribal council of... Uh, people in Alaska um, in collaboration with with, um, with a gaming company called Eli Media. And it is based on the, the indigenous people's oral uh, histories and traditions and ideas. 
And so it, it was basically made um, as a way to preserve these oral traditions and, and pass them down to a younger generation that might have been a bit less interested in, in learning them. But in the end, it became a global success. It sold millions, right? It's, I think it's currently the best example of a heritage game made by indigenous people on how, how to do this. It's, it's just magnificent. If anybody hasn't played it, you should absolutely play it. It also has co-op. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a traditional uh, Inupiaq tale. Um, and there are indigenous, indigenous people in the, in the game talking about it. And there are many other examples like this. Indigenous people from Mexico, for example, or people from West Asia. In, in 2018, we, we made an exhibition in Amsterdam with the Valley Foundation. It was called the Culture Arcade. It took place at the Prince Klaus van Gallery. And it was uh, an open exhibition. It was free for everyone to go in. And we had 14 games from around the world, from North Africa, from uh, Australia, from Alaska, from Mexico, uh, from Arabia, fr from Brazil. And all of them had something to do with the, uh, the, the heritage of these places, the heritage of the indigenous people of these places. Um, and there were so many games that we had to exclude because we only had limited space, right? But there is just so much out there that is admittedly a bit harder to follow because there's such a big game production. But because there is also such a big game production, there are so many gems to find and, and for people to play with. And interestingly, because you talked about guns, this might stray a tiny bit, but one of the things that we talk about in this course, the Past Play class, is also about, uh, we talk about queer games. So there was this um, developer uh, called Robert Young, who made a game called the Tea Room. Uh, hopefully, yeah, he made this game called the Tea Room, which is a, it's a free game. You can, you can look it up. It's banned on Twitch. It's a free historical public bathroom simulator. And it's about the, it's about 60s and the uh, oppression of uh, gay men who had to go into bathrooms um, and the police trying to snatch them out, basically. And in this game, instead of uh, a penis, the men have guns. Basically, the game is literally you have to suck another dude's gun. Uh, and he made this this whole claim because he says, I'm, I want to make a game about the oppression uh, that gay men had in the 60s. And I can't put it on Steam because I want to show penises. But there is no problem, apparently, showing guns. So there, I'm going to put a gun in it, which tackles all these issues at the same time, right? Um, queer, queer games are such a big and, and beautiful field. I, it's, uh, it's a lot to do. But all of these things goes to show that there is such a vast field of games that can be inclusive, that can be diverse, that can be vocal about minorities, about indigenous peoples, and so on, um, that it's worth exploring and it's worth doing more with it. Yeah. OK, that oh, there's 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 so much there, Aris. I, there's there's so many more games I have to play now. And I'll I'll just have to tell my family, you know, this I have to. I have no choice. Yeah. Um, it's for work. Yes, it's it's for work. Um, we're we're running out of time, so I guess this is the point where I just say, what what do you feel like that we we need to cover before before we go? And I'll say, like, let's keep this conversation going. This this doesn't need to be the last time you and I talk video games on this podcast. So this isn't the final final word, but you know, um, what 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 should people know as they want to understand how to think about video games as a as an, a way into the past and as a topic of academic study. Yeah, well, I think we should absolutely talk more about it at, uh, at other times. Also, if because now that the conversation is a bit general, we can also talk about more specifics. And I think that's one of the beauty of these things that there are just so many things to talk about. And there are also a lot of problems. And yeah, we can talk about 
in a, it's it's interesting, right? Because I am a gamer and you're a gamer and we can, in a way, we're nerding out. And people listening to this podcast might be at point, and I understand this and I apologize to all the listeners that at times this can be a bit dense, right? I have all this information in my head. You have all this information in your head. I'm just spewing out names and saying blah, blah, blah all these games. Um, and it's very hard to follow. And I, I had this issue with my students as well, because when, when you teach in a classroom of 100 students, not all 100 of them are gamers. So as popular as video games are, it, it is not this all-encompassing thing that everybody can associate with. So I would say, if you want to use video games, you should be also considerate for what other people know about them in the same way that you're considerate about the contents of your courses or the contents of the things you want to talk about for education you should be considerate about what other people want to uh, about whether what other people know and how you spark your their interest for the thing that you want to use because they do offer all these opportunities but we need to make these opportunities um, accessible as well as much as video games is already an accessible medium you need to make the space accessible as well. Um, one of the things we do with with the Value Foundation um, is that we do a lot of public events, public outreach events. We have a project we call the Rominecraft, which is in, in that is a very smart pun because it's Rominen, it's the Romans and Minecraft. So it's Rome Minecraft. And we go from city to city. We have this remade this uh, map of the Netherlands. In, uh, in Minecraft and one to four scale. And we go from city to city in the Netherlands that has Roman heritage there. And we do public events in museums, in plazas, in cafes. And we say, hey, everybody knows, everybody sort of knows how to play Minecraft. And if you don't, it's very easy. Come sit, we have PCs, we offer like four or five PCs and people can sit there and rebuild into one to one scale the Roman forts or the Roman cities that were in their place. And we've done that now for years. This Minecraft project had more than 2,000 people participating and building. And we have all these beautiful reconstructions that were not done by us. They were done by, by the public and by the imagination of the public. We're there, we sort of try to curate a bit and we have a booklet with information and we tell them if you, th you want to know this is how we think it looked as archaeologists, but do whatever you want. Build it however you like. And we have all these amazing builds, and we've done it with other places as well. In Belgium, we've done it for Nineveh, for the exhibition at the National Museum here. And Minecraft is a good example of this low threshold, like low entry point game that people can associate very easily with. And it creates this opportunity to do different things and build different things. Um, so it's also not only we talked a lot about the classroom and we talked a lot about the, a bit higher up in the gamers, but it's also something that you can do for heritage outreach and for you can use games to literally just go out there, ask people to play and have conversations with them. It's a very practical thing and it and it's a very social thing. Games tend to be blamed as this antisocial thing that you sit alone in your room, in your dark room, right, in your mom's basement, and you play games, uh, mainly as, as a guy. But this is not true. People want to play games together. Everybody plays games. It's not only boys that play games. It's girls, it's women, it's everybody, right? We, we've been saying about this big queer gaming scene. Everybody plays games. Um, so go out there and sort of do it and play and, and talk about them. And if they are problematic, talk about their problems. Don't discard them. Just talk about them. I mean, if you want to discard them eventually, sure. But in the same way that we talk about problematic literature, because we do talk about problematic literature. We can talk about Tolkien and all the issues that exist in Lord of the Rings, and there are a lot, but we still read Lord of the Rings, right? Um, so go out there, talk about them, engage with them, engage with the players, be a player because, and in the end, as we, to, to come full, full circle a bit, it's all about having fun. And that's why it's so such a good medium to learn with because 
you do learn when you're having fun and you do create an opportunity for learning when you're playing. So take that opportunity to help people learn, to learn yourself and learn with other people. That that was perfect. Thank you so much for, um, I just loved your, your focus on inclusion all the way through here because I think you're right. There's, or maybe I brought this up. There's a way that if you're not doing video games, you're doing something exclusive and you're excluding a large number of people and you're excluding a key cultural place. But then there's yeah. also ways that if you do bring in video games, uh, exclusion comes with that and your and your sensitivity on how to fight that. I mean, it's given me new new ideas um, about video games. Wonderful, Aris. Uh, last question, what are you playing right now? Well, I am obviously playing Elden Ring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> because I'm a big From Software to Dark Souls fan. And this, I have to say, uh, um, another just hot take to close this off, but I think Elden Ring is, if not the best, definitely one of the best games that have ever been made. Okay, this is, if you don't know what we're talking about, this this is a very hot take, and it's going to be adjudicated for decades yeah. uh, longer. I am yeah. playing... Uh, I'm playing the Chrono Cross Remastered Edition on Switch, which um, nice. was, was a game that I almost forgot about, and then it popped up again, and I've just been transported to whatever, 1997. I just am yeah. in 1997, and it is, a, it, is a strange, it is a strange feeling. Thank you so much, Arts. Thank you. Hello again. I, I was wondering during this conversation, whether there, we were going to lose a lot of people by dropping the names of video games. And um, I understand for those of you who do not play video games, that that was an impossible conversation to follow. Sorry about that. Hope, hopefully you just skipped it. Or even better, you were able to get a lot out of it anyway. Um, as we mentioned, Aris will be back on the show to talk about Graeburn Wingrow's The Dawn of Everything with a few of his uh, anarchist archaeologist colleagues. And I've got lots of links in the show notes to Aris's work and the work of Value, the foundation that he is a part of. Now, I must ask, again, for your help in keeping this podcast going. That can be going to everydayanarchism.com and giving financially. That's the biggest help. Or just spreading the word, telling a friend, leaving a rating on Apple or Spotify. All of that helps keep the show going. The music, which you're about to hear is by David Hill.